I hope everyone's uh, been enjoying <coughs> uh, the readings um, from uh, uh, from this book, from uh, Buddha's Brain. And um, I, I spoke last week, and I'll be talking a little bit about this. This is uh, Canada's Mental Health Magazine. Remember, I brought up the question. So, when we learn things about Buddhism and about Buddhism as dozen martial arts, uh, does it result in anything? And so we'll be discussing this. Um, I'll be discussing it over tonight and the course of next week as well. Um, but it's nice when we're on the cover, huh? <laughs> Canada's Mental Health. Uh, so this is a magazine, a professional magazine for psychiatrists and psychologists. And um, uh, this was the first important study ever done on, uh, academic study ever done on martial arts and what happens to people who, who train martial, martial arts, you know, done in the, in the scientific procedure. And um, so it had quite an impact. Um, this is the, uh, uh, this was on adults, this is on children, and once again we're on the cover, some of you may recognize uh, uh, Melanie Konzek, <laughs> she was nine years old in this one, and uh, this page, Sonia Konzek, <laughs> and you'll recognize a whole bunch of other people uh, uh, when you look through it. I wanted to start by um, uh, on, on page uh, 16, and um, people could follow me if you have the book. Okay, it's not necessary, but you know you, you might like to follow it with the book. Um, but I wanted to go through uh, a bunch of places that I thought were were particularly important in the book, and especially so because of what I said at the end of class last night <coughs> that. Uh, Although I think it's, in general, an excellent book, there are quite a few things that I, I really don't like about the book and about their approach. Uh, I spoke a little bit about it, but I'll be speaking a lot more about it uh, um, now. It's a, it's a different perspective. It's, it's, um, it concerns the different perspectives of what Buddhism is, because as I, as I mentioned, there's not one Buddhism. Uh, there's Tibetan Buddhism, there's Vietnamese Buddhism, there's Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Okinawan each have their own type of Buddhism, and I mean this is nothing, nothing new. Okay, it's the same thing in uh, in other so-called religions. You know, there's many different types of Islam. There's Orthodox Judaism, uh, conservative reform, and there's a whole bunch of new things that are growing day by day. Um, and it's the same thing in different philosophies. Okay, there's uh, Heidegger and uh, Heidegger the Nazi, and Heidegger the sort of existential Sartrean type thinker. Um, there was Karl Marx, the founder of Marxism, who, before he died, well before he died, said, I can't believe this. This is what my philosophy has turned into. I am not a Marxist. Okay? One of the most famous examples of somebody who really was you know, just appalled at what he was seeing, the way his, the way his philosophy was being brought out by, by other people. If he had ever seen what it would have resulted in with Stalin, I mean, that would have been, <laughs> that would have been the final coup. Okay, so on page uh, 16, second paragraph, being on your own side. It's a general moral principle that the more power you have over someone, the greater your duty is to use that power benevolently. Well, who is the one person in the world you have the greatest power over? It's your future self. You hold that life in your hands, and what it will be depends on how you care for it. Uh, I think that's very well put. That, amount, that moment has stayed with me. Because of what it taught me, I'm sorry, I skipped the paragraph, of what it taught me about what is and isn't within our control. It's, he's talking about a personal experience he has, and it made him understand what is and what isn't within our control. It's impossible to change the past or the present. You can only accept all that as it is, but you can tend to the causes of a better future. Most of the ways you'll do this are small and humble. To use examples from later in this book, you could take a very full inhalation in a tense meeting to force a long exhalation, thus activating the calming parasympathetic nervous system. Or when remembering an upsetting experience, recall the feeling of being with someone who loves you, which will gradually infuse the upsetting memory with a positive feeling. Or to steady the mind, deliberately prolong feelings of happiness, as this will increase the levels of neurotransmitted dop dopamine, which will help your attention stay focused. And 
remember, you know, again, it comes back to the importance of understanding that you have power over whether you want to have negative thoughts or positive thoughts. And we know where the positive thoughts will lead. I mean, this has been well shown in this book and, and in other books. We also know where the negative thoughts will lead. And we want to stay away from that. That's something that's really important. We want to stay away from that. These, uh, this is the page, the top of page 17. These little actions really add up over time. And that's important. They really do add up over time. Every day, ordinary activities, as well as any personal growth or spiritual practices, contain dozens of opportunities to change your brain from the inside out. You really do have that power, which is, wonderful, which is a wonderful thing in a world full of forces beyond your control. A single raindrop doesn't have much effect, but if you have enough raindrops and enough time, you can carve a Grand Canyon. But to take these steps, you have to be on your own side. That may not be so easy at first. Most people bring less kindness to themselves than to others. To get on your own side, it can be helpful to make a convincing case for tending to the causes that will change your brain for the better. On page 18, okay, key points. What happens in your mind changes your brain, both temporarily and in lasting ways. Neurons that fire together, wire together. And what happens in your brain changes your mind, since the brain and mind are a single integrated system. Therefore, you can use your mind to change your brain to benefit your mind and everyone else whose life you touch. People who have practiced deeply in the contemplative traditions are the Olympic athletes of the mind. Learning how they train their minds reveals powerful ways to have more happiness, love, and wisdom. The brain evolved to help you survive, but its three primary survival strategies also make you suffer. Remember? Okay? Because we're more easily attuned to negative things because that's what kept us alive. Negative things meaning feeling fear of a predator that's just about to attack you. And human beings are sort of programmed to, to react to these things very strongly because our lives are at stake. And so we have to remember that these negative things were more important to our survival in our earlier stages of primate development than thinking happy thoughts, okay? Because thinking happy thoughts will make you, you know, maybe a better friend, a better wife or husband. But it's, you know, it's not going to be that much in terms of keeping you alive for this moment while that tiger is roaming around and you're not really aware of it. You're just kind of sitting around thinking happy thoughts, okay? So it's really important to realize that whether we like it or not, we are programmed more for negativity than we are for positivity. That's why we have to use our own will, our own spirit, to make sure that we put the balance where it should be. Um, you know, evolution is blind. There's no, you know, there's no thing, you know, like, hmm, let's try it this way. Oh, that's a better way. That's not the way it works, okay? It's caught up with survival, and that's what it's worth. And the other things are, are all secondary to that survival aspect. Virtue, mindfulness, and wisdom are the pillars of everyday well-being personal growth, and spiritual practice. They draw on the three fundamental neutral, neural functions of regulation, learning, and selection. The path of awakening involves both transforming the mind, brain, and uncovering the wonderful true nature that was there all along. Small positive actions every day will add up to large changes over time as you gradually build new neural structures. To keep at it, you need to be on your own side, which is the way we started this discussion. Wholesome changes in the brains of many people could help tip the world in a better direction. Isn't that true? Okay, we can turn to page uh, 26. Three survival strategies. Over hundreds of millions of years of evolution, our ancestors, de ancestors developed three fundamental strategies for survival. Creating separations in order to form boundaries between themselves and the world and between one mental state and another. Maintaining stability in order to keep physical and mental systems in, in a healthy balance. Approaching opportunities and avoiding threats in order to gain things that promote offspring and escape or resist things that don't. These strategies have been extraordinarily effective for survival, but Mother Nature doesn't care how they feel. To motivate animals, including ourselves, to follow these strategies and pass on their genes, neural networks evolved to create pain and distress under certain conditions when separations break down, when stability is shaken, when opportunities disappoint and threats loom. Unfortunately, these conditions happen all the time because everything is connected. Everything keeps changing. Opportunities routinely remain unfulfilled or lose their luster, and many threats are inescapable, such as aging and death. 
this is a really, really interesting paragraph because I'm sure I'm not the only one who can say, damn it, things have changed. <laughs> you, know, you know, just when you're about to go to your favorite store to pick up some things and you get there and he's gone out of business, you know? And you get really frustrated about all the things in our lives that are changing and never more so than now because it's just more and more rapidly changing. And, you know, some people have difficulty dealing with it. The pace of change, they just can't keep up. And other people, and this is something that we should be getting out of our martial arts training, understand it as a part of life. And instead of getting upset, we can just say, okay, at least we got some good exercise. We walked to the store, we did this, we did that, you know. I mean, we can deal with it. It's not so bad. You'll find another place. Everything keeps changing. And as much as we try sometimes to separate ourselves from craziness that's around us, lousy professors, you know, friends that, uh, you know, are disappointing. Um, the, the reality is, is everything is connected. You know, we're connected to these things. We have to, we, you know, even if we don't like our job, many people have to stay with it because there's not a lot of opportunities to just snap your fingers and find another job. Um, so the realization of these things should help us to understand how important it is that we build our own power within ourselves. And, um, this is something that, well, this is one approach in this book that they're talking about. But that, remember that uh, the Dozen is somewhat of a different approach. Okay? Now, I chose this book because I wanted to use that approach. I wanted you to see a different way of looking at it than what we look at in the dojo every day. Okay? You hear me talking about things every day. But in this book, you'll come across language that I would never use. Okay? Because it's a different type of, of Buddhism. It's a Buddhism of, of meditation and feeling good. Uh, I'm sorry, the Zazen, sitting meditation and feeling good and um, finding your center, which is all very nice. But when we get to it, we'll be seeing the big differences between this and martial arts type of, Zen, of, of, uh, of Buddhism. Okay, let's turn to page uh, 41, please. Sensitivity to negative information. The brain typically detects negative information faster than positive information, of course. Take facial expressions, a primary signal of threat or opportunity for a social animal like us. Fearful faces are perceived much more rapidly than happy or neutral one, probably fast-tracked by the amygdala. In fact, even when researchers make fearful faces invisible to conscious awareness, the amygdala still lights up. The brain is drawn to bad news. Okay, that's bad for us. Huh? I mean, it's true. You know, if somebody comes into the in, into your house and they're crying, we react to that a lot stronger than if they come in and they're smiling. I mean, we react to that favorably, but but it, you know, crying or you know uh, uh, somebody who looks really unhappy that gets results. Negative things make us move, and in many situations, that will be a factor that will save our lives. Somebody may be crying. Because there's a wolf that's just been chasing them. And you better close the doors, you know, and the windows. And you have to move fast. You react a lot different than somebody who's smiling. High priority storage. When an event is flagged as negative, the hippocampus makes sure it's stored carefully for future reference. Once burned, twice shy. Your brain is like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. Even though most of your experiences are probably neutral or positive. Negative trumps positive. Negative events generally have more impact than positive ones. For example, it's easy to acquire feelings of learned helplessness from a few failures, but hard to undo those feelings, even with many successes. Isn't that true? You know, you know when something brings you down, it's a lot harder to get beyond that than when something makes you feel happy, but it seems much more fleeting. People will do more to avoid a loss than to acquire a comparable gain. Compared to lottery winners, accident victims usually take longer to return to their original baseline of happiness. Bad information about a person carries more weight than good information. Of course, because bad information is negative, and we have to be aware of that. We have to be able to save our lives. And in relationships, it typically takes... I love this one. And in relationships, it typically takes about five positive interactions 
to overcome the effects of a single negative one. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> okay, page 71. He's talking about memory and activation of the memory and how it's built upon past experiences. So second paragraph, 71. The next time the memory is activated, it will tend to bring associations with it. Thus, if you repeatedly bring to mind negative feelings and thoughts while the memory is active, then that memory will increasingly shaded in a negative direction. For example, recalling an old failure while sim simultaneously lambasting yourself will make that failure seem increasingly awful. Now remember the, the, uh, the words that count here. If you repeatedly bring to mind negative feelings and thoughts while a memory is active, okay, so you're building upon, you're already in, in, a, in a negative sense. It just makes it worse. On the other hand, <clears throat> if you call up positive emotions and perspectives while <clears throat> implicit or explicit memories are active, these wholesome influences will slowly be woven into the fabric of those memories. Every time you do this, every time you sift positive feelings and views into painful, limiting states of mind, you build a little bit of neural structure. Over time, the accumulating image impact of this positive material will literally, synapse by synapse, change your brain. Most of the time, taking in the good takes less than a minute, often just a few seconds. It's a private act. No one needs to know you're doing it. But over time, you really can build new positive structures in your brain. Remember I was talking about my father and that generation. Remember? It's not just my father. It was that generation that was known as, you know, just living in the worst possible times. And it made me often think about the fact, boy, am I glad I was born, you know, in a later period when, when it wasn't a war, a depression, another war, and, you know, all, all the horrors that, uh, that went with this. But it's, 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 it's amazing that after all those years of negativity and not being able, not, not just, as I say, not just my father, but that whole generation, all my father's friends from that generation, you know, that it, it was amazing that before he died, we were able to, to change his perspective on things. And that was, that was truly remarkable. Even if it was only for a few years. Even if it's just one day of happiness, that counts for a great deal. And it's funny because I had tried for a lifetime and, you know, couldn't do it. But I think what really made the difference in our family, I think, was with our children. Wouldn't you say, Francois? Absolutely. You know, coming to visit him with, with uh, Sonia and Melina and, uh, you know, just seeing his grandchildren that, that uh, growing into such fantastic young women, it just, just made such, a, such an incredible difference in his life. Uh, it's, it's really funny. It took so long, but in the end, we had never given up. And that's what made everything so, so particularly meaningful, okay? We've never given up, and in the end, something really positive came out of that. It's nice to think that somebody died happily, you know? You know, that he wasn't afraid, you know, he was accepting, he had lived those last few years as the best years of his life, and that, that's, that's really important. Okay, on, uh, once again on page 75, midway through the third paragraph. Positive feelings have far-reaching benefits, including a stronger immune system and a cardiovascular system that is less reactive to stress. And that's really, really interesting, isn't it? Positive feelings have far-reaching benefits, including a stronger immune system and a cardiovascular system that is less reactive to stress. They lift your mood, increase optimism, resilience, and resourcefulness, and help counteract the effects of painful experiences, including trauma. It's a positive cycle. Good feelings today increase the likelihood of good feelings tomorrow. We have to keep thinking that in mind, you know, keep, keep keeping that in mind, because there's always the negative, and the negative will always be there. It will always be there. It's not just you or you or you, okay? The negative will always come into your mind. And you have to have the will, which unfortunately most people don't have, to be able to say, no, I don't want this, you know? I'm, I'm going to think positively about that. No matter how much time it takes me and how much effort, you know, to switch that around, I'm not going to play this game with the negative. I'm going to conquer the negative and bring in the positive. And just not get angry at yourself for allowing the negative to enter. That's our, that's our biology, okay? There's nothing we can do about that. It will enter, 
because that has been king for millions of years. And, you know, our life is not millions of years. We don't have all those years to fight it. We have a very short span that we can either choose to give into it, because it is a fact, or we can say that we can fight it. As Karatika, it's nice to have that imagery that we never give up. Huh? We never give up. It's good that we can define ourselves as people, that we can do this. We can really do this. I have to tell you a funny story. That um, um, When we moved into this house, um, my, uh, my father and stepmother came, came up to visit us. And uh, they were really excited, you know, because... Uh, you know, about, about us getting a new house. And, and uh, Sonia was six years old, Melanie was three years old. And um, uh, we, we were all together at the house. And every time we went out for a walk or something, uh, Melina, who was a particularly rambunctious three-year-old, and she would just be running and running and running all over the place, up and down the stairs and running on the street and everything. And so I, we always had to keep a hand on her. Okay, well, you know, she's three years old, so, you know, you have, to keep, you have to keep a hand. But if you're not careful, you know, like I could be talking to somebody, and all of a sudden I feel that hand is empty, you know, and, you know, within a second I'll react, you know. But within a second, boy, Melanie could run fast, you know, so I'd have to get her. And one time, we took uh, my uh, father and stepmother for dinner, uh, and we were at, on, Saint, on the St. Clair near Young. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, the sidewalks are pretty wide there. And so we were talking, I was staying close to the, um, to the, to the buildings, so I had some room. And um, it seems that every time uh, my father was saying something, Melanie would let go of the hand, and i have to chase her down, and, and one time, and another time, and another time. And so um, I, I came to my father with Melanie in my arms, and I said, you know, Dad, I'm, I'm really sorry that, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I've got a child who's, you know, incredibly active and and she just likes to run around a lot and you'll have to forgive me for that please and he said no that's okay i had a child like that once (laughs) 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 i thought that was so funny (laughs) so we began talking about uh about uh, karate you know and um and uh he said that when uh when i was a child he would get very angry when when i would do that and he said, what, what is nice is that you don't get angry. You know, you just, you know, she lets go and you run after her and you, you know, and if necessary, you pick her up and you carry her. And, you know, that, that's, that's really nice. You know, I'm really glad to see that. I would get very angry, and I, I, you know, and, uh, you know, it's good to see your son who's able to be able to do things in a better way. And I said to him, that, that's really nice. Thank you, Dad. I, you know, that's a really nice, you know, compliment. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think I've ever heard him compliment me before. That's not his style, you know? Yeah, my gosh, this was a compliment. You know, I couldn't believe it. And he said, hey, don't think so highly of yourself, you know? It's not <laughs> you, it's the karate, you know? <laughs> if I had been able to take karate, I would have been able to be like you with my kids, you know? <laughs> I thought that was really cute. <laughs> and meanwhile, I lost my place. Okay, I think we were on 75, weren't we? Okay. So, the last paragraph, I, I love this, this, uh, this particular paragraph because it relates to children. Okay. These benefits apply to children as well. You know, the positive cycle, right? In particular, taking in the good as a special payoff for kids at either the spirited or the anxious end of the temperamental structure. structure sorry, structure. Spirited children usually zip along to the next thing before good feelings have a chance to consolidate in the brain. And anxious children tend to ignore or downplay good news. And some kids are both spirited and anxious. Whatever their temperament, if children are part of your life, encourage them to pause for a moment at the end of the day or at any other natural interval, such as the last minute before the school bell, to remember what went well and think about things that make them happy. For example, a pet, their parents' love, a goal scored in soccer. Then have those positive feelings and thoughts sink in. I think this is, uh, you know, uh, many of you have children. I, I think it's particularly interesting because, I mean, this is something that, that um, we did with our children. And uh, I'm, I'm sure this drove them crazy all the time. But when they would get home from school and we'd be preparing dinner before going to the dojo, we would always ask our children, okay, so what good thing has happened today? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the idea is to get them to talk about good things because 
Of course, what rests in everybody's mind, just before having dinner, is the negative things, because we're human beings, and that's the way we're programmed to think. So if something, you know, in, in, in any given day, there'll be good things and bad things, but before dinner, you'll sit down, and you'll be thinking of the bad things, because that's the way we are. And it's also, it's because it's just before dinner, and we're hungry. We'll feel better after dinner, then the negativity can be less. But that's a particularly volatile time. So it's really nice to begin by talking about, okay, what good things happened today? And even if they don't want to talk about it, then you can talk about it. What good things happened today and what type of an impact it had on our lives. Taking it in the third paragraph on the page, uh, 76, taking in the good is not about putting a happy, shiny face on everything, nor is it about turning away from the hard things in life. It's about nourishing well-being, contentment, and peace inside that are refuges uh, refuge where you can always come from and return to. Then on uh, a couple of paragraphs down, uh, key points. Unfortunately, the bias of the brain tilts implicit memories in a negative direction, even when most of your experiences are actually positive. That's the fact. Okay, page 79, please. The uh, first uh, italics. Indeed, the sage who's fully quenched rests at ease in every way. No sense desire adheres to him, whose fires have cooled, deprived of fuel. Then the second one. All attachments have been severed. The heart's been led away from pain. Tranquil he rests with utmost ease. The mind has found its way to peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I read this and I think it's far away from, from me and from and from the life that we live in the 21st century, or that the life that maybe some people in the monasteries a thousand years ago or 2,500 years ago at the time of Buddha would have been looking for, I think it's something very, very different than, than what, what is today. And I don't know why they would try to bring this up today. Like these are citations that are uh, attributed to, to Buddha himself. But again, that was 2,500 years ago. And I think, they, I think they put the stress on the wrong things here. Um, I spoke about, uh, in the first class, about my experience in the monasteries. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate in that I was sent all over Japan. I, I taught at many monasteries. I had many doors that opened up for me. And it was really, really wonderful. And I enjoyed it immensely. But at the same time, remember I told you that when I came back to Tokyo and was with my close friends, they were criticizing the types of things that go on in the monasteries. And, um, uh, you know, my own feelings were so positive just about the experience, you know, of teaching karate there, having the opportunities of communicating, of learning their lifestyle. But at the same time, I remember things that really bothered me a great deal. Like there was a lot of chanting. And, you know, to me, this was a lot of time just being wasted, chanting and chanting, you know. And, um, you know, it, it's not praying. It's just chanting, you know. I mean, repeating things, trying to develop a sort of a, a, a state of mind. Now, remember, I had been asked to come there to teach them martial arts. Obviously, they had felt there was a need for martial arts. There really was a need. These guys were really pathetically out of shape. I remember it was all men. So the monastery made me feel ill at ease, always living amongst men and women, okay? Um, living in a house with three women, you know, and being the only man. So this, this, was, this was really weird to me, and it was in, part of an environment that made me feel very, uh, very uncomfortable. Um, then the other thing is that, did I talk about the dinner? Eating, eating dinner? Okay. So, um, we'd eat supper every night together. Well, we ate the three meals together. But dinner was a, was a bigger meal. And um, uh, in a Buddhist monastery, you're silent during dinner. And dinner is very long, you know, because you're supposed to chew each uh, bite a thousand times. I don't think they were a thousand times, but it was a damn long time, you know. <laughs> I'm watching these monks 
you know, chew and chew and chew. And there's nothing else to do but watch. I would have loved to have talked to them, but I couldn't talk to them, right? So, you know, I'm just watching them chewing and chewing and chewing. How many times can you chew rice? You know, because it's mostly rice, right? There's no, there's no uh, meat or fish, you know, it's rice with vegetables. And very insufficient food for the amount of training that we were doing. And, um, you know, I had been trying to convince the headmaster to give us more food, which that part I think I, t I had told everyone about. And eventually he did get, he did get more food to us. But um, uh, you need food to be able to fuel action. But you see here, they're not talking about food and action and training and intensity. Here it's the sage who's fully quenched, rests at ease in every way, no sense desire adheres to him, whose fires have cooled, deprived of fuel. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, that's what made them you know, not give them too much to eat, you know, not give them too much fuel, not give them too much intensity. Because, you know, once, once I got them into training and once I got them more food, then we could start really doing karate more than just a 10 kilometer run and then just seeing them, you know, fall flat on their faces once we got back into the dojo. Um, it's, such, it's such a different approach than what we were doing as athletes practicing dozen at Nihon Taiko Daigaku, Japan Physical Education University. In the monastery, I felt I was with men who were half dead, partly because they weren't eating enough, partly because everything was oriented towards this no sense desire adheres to him, okay? And they were my friends, who both had wives and children, and there was a lot of sensuality, and there was a lot of sense desire. There was desire for their children. There was desire for their wives. There was just a feeling that life was to be lived, and life was to be lived in a really meaningful and happy way, and a large part of that life was the children, that this was the future, the children, and this was totally lacking in the monastery. There will be no children for the people of the monastery. Now, once you start thinking about that, you start thinking too, about something that becomes a little bit more, yet more difficult in this regard, about the monastery and what is desire and what is, um, what does it mean, fires have cooled, okay? As opposed to, I mean, I think all of us like to think here that we're strong, that we're in the prime, okay? That we can move, we can run, we can do karate, we can do all sorts of things. That life is always ahead of us. Not that we're tired all the time, you know? Because these men were tired all the time. Uh, most people don't know the story of uh, the background of the uh, Chinese invasion of Tibet. Uh, because the only thing that comes out about that is always the Tibetan side. The side from the Dalai Lama. Now the Dalai Lama is a great man. There's no question about that. And an honorable man. But when you look at the Dalai Lama, who's the leader of his country, and he's really a good leader, although he doesn't have a country. I mean, he says he's the leader of his country, but he doesn't have a country. Tibet will never be. I mean, he himself recognizes it. As much as he talks about one day, he hopes that there'll be, you know, conciliation with China. It's not going to happen. Okay? Tibet will always be part of China. And he will be dead soon. And the new person who will take over will probably not be as great a man that he is. It's a fact of life. Okay. But he still likes to talk about, you know, one day, you know, that Tibet will exist again. But one day Tibet did exist. And it was an independent country. And it was before the present Dalai Lama. And was it a democracy? No. Do people have rights to criticize the government? No. Why, of all the countries in the world, was Tibet just about the most static of all countries? How come in Tibet there are no children? I mean, I'm talking about the past, you know, when it was an independent country. There were no children in Tibet. 
You want to know why there were no children in Tibet? Tibet was very poor. One of the poorest countries in the world. Where was the Dalai Lama? Not the present Dalai Lama, because you know, he didn't come until later on. Okay. Where, because the Chinese invasion, Dalai Lama was the present Dalai Lama was still very young, but there had been a previous Dalai Lama. There had been many previous Dalai Lamas. None of them ever thought about democracy. None of them ever thought about channels of communication, so that the people could ask of them. I mean, even in China, which is an authoritarian country, there still are channels. Things do change, and the Chinese government since. Uh, since they first uh, conquered uh, China, since uh, Mao Zedong, the communists, first conquered China, they really did a remarkable, they, they, they faced a remarkable challenge, China being just about the poorest country in the world. And, you know, in a little more than 50 years, they transformed that country. It's still poor, and, and uh, you know, uh, in the coast it's very rich, and inland it's still poor, but nothing like it had once been. It's quite remarkable. The Chinese who attacked Tibet, attacked Tibet have claimed that they've been trying to modernize Tibet. Uh, Tibet. Did I say Quebec? <laughs> <laughs> Words are too similar. That they were trying to modernize uh, Tibet. Now, who knows? Who knows what their, their, their motives are, you know, uh, but the point is, Tibet is certainly a richer society today. The Dalai Lama responds by saying, well, if he were there, um, it would be even richer. You know, he, would have, he would have made more you know, changes, maybe. But for all those thousands of years where Tibet was a Buddhist country, and it was a theocracy, it was ruled by these men, and there was no democracy, and there was no channels of you know, communication, no courts of law, okay? But where were the children? There were no children. You see, because the society was very poor. So a family has a child. And they say, okay, what's going to happen to my little boy? You know what? Better we send him to the monastery, where at least he'll have three meals a day. And so we'll send them to live in the monastery. That's where all the children went, to live in the monastery. If you had girls, they'd stay with the family. You don't create new children, or very few new children, when all the boys are in the monastery, because that's where they can get three meals a day, and the girls are at home. And the girls grow up to women, girls grow up to be women, where there's a lot of women, but very, very few men. Because all the men were these boys who have grown up and they still live in the monastery because that's where they can get food. Now, very interestingly, too, the monasteries were not the halls of education, the halls of, you know, thinking of, of, of uh, uh, new perspectives, developing new philosophies, because most of the men who had grown up from these boys, they were not in the monastery because they were dedicated to Buddhism. They were in the monastery because that's where they can eat. So, things are a lot different than most people think, you know, when you think of, of Buddhism. So, I mean, imagine this. It's not just that the men are suffering in the monastery, because it's not the most pleasant place to be, but they're stuck there because that's where they can get some food. And what about the women? How happy are they? Well, very few of them are ever going to get husbands. Very few of them are ever going to have children. What a different world it is compared to our world. This was only... 60 or so years ago. You know, we're not talking about a long time ago. But it was 60 years ago, and 600 years ago it was like that, and a thousand years ago it was like that. It was an unchanging society, ruled by a theocracy of Buddhist monks. Now, the Dalai Lama makes all sorts of excuses about that, you know, and, and you know, um, talks about the fact that, uh, you know, when he, when he will become, when he will return to Tibet, he will change that. Well, of course, as I say, he will never return to Tibet, and he will never change that. And when he dies, and a new leader, Tibetan leader, comes up, and by some miracle, the Chinese say, come back, you know, it will still be the same way. Okay, because that's the way, that's the way for all these thousands of years it's been. And it's, 
something that is very, very different, as I say, than, than most people would think. Now, I'm going to tell you a very good story about the Dalai Lama. And this is something that made a huge impression upon me. A number of years ago, the Dalai Lama came to California and he gave a, a lecture. And you know, California is a very open society. It's not, like, uh, it's not like Tibet, right? It's not run by a Dalai Lama, you know, who makes the decisions and nobody can have any other say in it. Okay, so during uh, his speech, somebody raised their hand, say, uh, Sensei, um, we understand that amongst the Buddhist monks, there is no homosexuality allowed. And if somebody is a homosexual, they are thrown out of the monasteries. Um, we in California cannot accept that. What do you have to say? Now imagine that. I mean, this man who's in effect king, right? I mean, he's king of his country. And not being spoken privately, but this is California. You know, no, you know I mean, it's different than Tibet. Nobody's going to come up and say, you know... Let me talk to you privately if I can bring up, you know, you know, this is California. And the way he responded was absolutely amazing. He thought for a long time. He thought. That's a good thing to do when somebody's asking a difficult question. Don't you think so? I mean, before you say something stupid, think about what you're going to say. And so he thought for a long time. And he said that he's heard about these things. In California. <laughs> California is in the avant-garde, you know? And he's heard about these things, but he's never thought that these, these things really exist. Yes, it's true. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about this since you brought the question up. And I have to ask, please give me a few days to think about this. For 2,500 years, this is the way we in Buddhism have thought, that homosexuality is unnatural. But maybe it's time we change our, our, our thinking. But I, I, can't, I can't say this right now, after 10 minutes of, something, of thinking. I need to, I need to consult with, with other people. I need to hear their, their views on things. We need, to, we need to, to, to reread the ancient texts. So give me time to, to think about this. And eventually, he came up with a, you know, a, a pretty good perspective about the fact that life has to change. And that um, this is the way it's been for 2,500 years. It's going to be difficult for him and for his generation to say, okay, you know, let's all become gay or whatever, <laughs> you know. But that for a new generation, um, this is something we will have to get used to. We will have to... Uh, adapt to, you know, these conditions. This is something I consider to be amazing, you know, absolutely amazing. That somebody as old as he is, and with the background like he has, and as I say, you know, in effect being king of the hill, you know, that he was able to see the wisdom that not only is this a just cause, but that it's the only thing he can do. He's not stupid, right? He didn't say, no, I can never do this, you know, after 2,500 years. You know, he understood that these are people who are supporting his cause. And to say that, no, we will never accept homosexuality, that would be, a, that would, <laughs> he would lose all his support. Even Richard Gere would probably turn on him. You know? <laughs> For those who don't know, Richard Gere is, can we call him the prince on the hill? <laughs> 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 who else is the, uh, uh, What's that uh, martial arts guy who makes all these violent movies? Yeah, yeah. Boy, that's a that's a nice example of a, <laughs> of a Buddhist, you know, Stephen Seagal. You know, when he's not that, making the most weird violent. Thing yeah. Dalai Lama supporters. I know. I know. <laughs> this is really. It makes me wonder. You know, <laughs> you know, how far will you go <laughs> to get support from the Hollywood actor for your cause of creating a new Tibet in China, which isn't going to happen. Even Steven Seagal, okay, he's not going to be able to go and fight off all the, you know, uh, Chinese leaders and say, yeah, we're, we're establishing the new Tibetan state here. It's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, really, it's, uh, it's really quite amazing. So, with some of the negative things, there's also some of the positive things. I hope I'm not sounding too negative. I'm not meaning to sound negative. I'm just meaning to say that, well, 
Let me put it this way. Everyone knows I taught many years courses in Buddhism at University of Toronto, right? Yes, sir. So uh, I would always explain to my students the first day that this is an academic course in Buddhism. We're studying it as university students. We're not studying it as a religion. We're not studying it as a way of truth. We're going to be critical of what we read and what we study. And we're also going to be, I'm sure, just like all of you will be, like I am, marveling at some of the wonderful ideas that will come out of Buddhism. But we're not just going to be saying, this is the truth. And every year, I mean, honestly, every year, this is the truth. I would come into the class, and I, I would always try to arrange to be the last one. I, I, I don't like to be the first one coming in. I like to see, you know, who's going to be in the class and everything. And inevitably, I see somebody not sitting in a chair or on the floor, but sitting on a table in a meditation position, you know, his hands like this, his eyes closed, you know. And I'd have to start the lecture and wait for him to sort of come out of his trance, you know, and then explain to him that there will be a rigorous reading regimen. And if you do not keep up with the reading, you will fail this class. It's not because you're not doing the reading. It's because when I give you the exams, which will be difficult, you will fail if you don't read these books, and they're going to be difficult books. And I would see that guy that was always there in every year I taught the course, and he would simply get off of his table and walk out of the room. <laughs> and I would always say, hey, great. This is a great start to the semester. Everyone would laugh. It was the same thing every year, every year, year after year, for all the years I taught the course. So there was one year that I was teaching karate uh, at the athletic center. We had, we, had, we had a big karate program. And um, I had a, uh, a student who was a, a Japanese woman. Um, I was in big class, so she was one of my many students. And um, she was one of the most difficult students I ever had. Not, not that she was a difficult person, but she just couldn't get the technique. She was just had so much trouble. You know, it, it looked like she had never done anything physical in her life. And so, uh, you know, I, I uh, spoke to her one day, and uh, I, you know, because she came to see me after class, asking should she drop out, you know, she's keeping everyone back. I said, no, no, you know, you're putting in the effort. I admire that. You know, uh, you know, some people pick it up quickly. Some people, you know, take, take a lot of time. And she was very appreciative about that. And I, I asked her, you know, so... Uh, you know, are, are you a student? Are you a fourth-year student or a graduate student? She said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor. I said, oh, okay. You know, she was so small, and, um, you know, she looked so, you know, ill at ease in her skin, you know? So, um, okay, that's fine. Then a couple of months later, after all this effort and all this trying, you know, and she was, she was really working hard, and she came up to see me again, and she said, one of my students... Uh, she's talking to me. One of my students told me that um, you're her professor in Zen, in, in, in Buddhism, excuse me. And I said, yeah. And she said, do you know, do, do you know, you know I'm a professor? And I said, yeah. Do you know what I teach? I said, no. And she says, I teach a course in Buddhism as well. I said, hey, that's neat, you know. So where's your course? My course was in the, uh, the uh, Department of East Asian Studies. And I said, well, so where's your course? She said, she's studying, in, uh, she's uh, teaching in religious studies. All the way on the other end of the campus. Okay. So I said, that's interesting. So I said, you know, since you're studying, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, you're looking at it from a religious studies perspective, um, you must be using, I'm sure you're using different books than I'm using. And uh, I asked her if she can give me some, if she could loan me some of the books. And she says, yeah, more than that, I'll, I'll give you some of the uh, scholarly material that I've written on, on the subject. So she gave me a whole bunch of uh, manuscripts, which was really, really um, abstruse Buddhist uh, theological material. Frankly, it didn't interest me at all. But, uh, but you know, I was impressed, you know, with, it, with, with, her, with her learning and everything. And then she asked me a couple of months after that, would you mind if I came to your class and audited your class? I said, wow, that would be great. You know, my students would have two teachers, you know, and I love it. You know, I said, if you want to do that, 
I'd like you to, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's my role to teach the course, but I'd love for you to have, how much do you want? 15 minutes, a half an hour, every class. Because I think it was, two, it was a two-hour class at that time. Two hours, and then a second class uh, later in the week for one hour. So she said, yeah, she'd love that. So she would teach part of the class. And it's so, it was so different, the perspectives. Because my class was focusing on Japanese Buddhism and the martial arts. And her class was focusing on more on Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, it was a totally different, different perspective. It's like we were in you know, two different worlds. But it was really, really interesting uh, seeing how she would approach it, never being critical of Buddhism, but just talking about, you know, the, the, the scholarly approach, this is the way, you know, this is the way it is, you know, this is the way the Tibetans do it, or this is the way the Vietnamese do it, you know, et cetera. Whereas we were looking for, well, we were focusing, as I say, on Japanese Buddhism and its origins in China. Now, of course, they go further back to India, but I can only do so much in a year. Okay? It was a year course, but we were focusing on the origins in China, and that was as far back as we went. And... Um, over time, she began to get better in her martial arts. And in time, she became very good at this. And so when we had our, our, our courses, it was really interesting how her perspective began to change. No longer looking so much at Tibetan Buddhism, and now being, you know, taking a look at other aspects of Buddhism, especially the Japanese, because she was... She was becoming more comfortable in her skin. She could do down blocks. She could do tenokata, you know, which required, you know, the, the hip rotations and things like that. And it wasn't the language anymore of this type of, you know, uh, all attachments have been severed. The heart's been led away from pain. Tranquil, he rests with utmost ease. The mind has found its way to peace. Now she was using, like, karate do terminology, you know, karate do imagery. And it was a whole different world. And it was... Uh, it was it was it was really something to see how that how that changed. Uh, unfortunately, we had we had become very close friends. Her husband was also a professor. He was teaching part time at uh, at the university. He was a professor of English, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of jobs for professors of English. Um, but you know, he had, at least he was fortunate. He had a part time job, and um, so the four of us, Francoise and myself, and uh, and this woman and her husband became very close friends, and we would often have dinners together on, on Friday evenings. And then she was notified that she was fired. Can you imagine that? That's what it was like in those days, in the 1970s. A woman can be fired just like that. Religious studies. How many women do you think were in the department? <laughs> she was the only one. Most of the men there were... Catholic priests, and because this was religious studies, it was at St. Michael's College, okay, which was a Catholic institution. When she had been hired, it was a kind of a charade, you know. Well, let's give Buddhism. Let's pretend that we're open-minded here, and you know, in addition to having Catholicism, we'll also have some Buddhism. But I guess she overstepped her bounds, and they just, you know, on a, on a moment's notice, told her she's fired. Now you can do that because she didn't have tenure yet. This was amazing because she was such a, I mean, it wasn't just my feelings of how good a scholar she was. Um, she had had her work published in all the leading academic journals, you know, in her field. Um, she, was, she was just magnificent, you know. And um, so, unfortunately, she had to leave University of Toronto. Um, but you know what? The good news in this is that... She was offered a tenure stream position at Stanford University in California. <laughs> and so she went to Stanford. She eventually got her tenure, and she's still a professor at Stanford. Isn't that something? Really bad. U of T. Let her go. These stupid men, you know, you know, getting rid of their token women, their token Buddhists, sending her off. And we lost a scholar of that caliber, you know, who became really, really well-known in her field, you know. Uh, and she invited us out... Uh, um, to, to visit her at, um, at uh, Stanford and to do, um, she did arrange for us to um, karate demonstration and, uh, and a lecture, and it was, it was, it was really magnificent. So, uh, 
really interesting. There is justice in the world. It's nice to see that. <laughs> okay, so coming back to uh, uh, what we were talking about before. In the monasteries, there were no children. To be a, a Tibetan monk, there'll be no children. As I mentioned before, too, there's no taxes. Okay? There's not a lot of worries. So these people can really sh focus on their lack of stress. That's the great thing about Buddhism, you know, the lack of stress. It's become sort of like a mantra, you know, to, to live your life without stress. This is a crazy thing. Because they can do that. They don't have children. Because if you have children, you have stress. Okay? That's life. That's the way it's going to be. You're not going to have a stress-free life. The moment your first child is born, stress-free life goes out the window. Okay? And, you know, but most people don't complain about that. You know what I mean? Having children is a remarkable experience. And to sort of counter this with this philosophy from 2,500 years ago, emphasizing, you know, the ability to live without stress, it seems crazy, you know? It means living without children. It means living in a world, again, without taxes. It's living in an artificial world. So these monks can say all that they want about how fantastic they are in these different dimensions of Buddhism. Um, if you really think about it, it's not something that's so fantastic. Any idiot can do it if you don't have children. You know, you can just sit down and watch television all day and live a stress-free life. It's not a very meaningful life. But do these monasteries give a very meaningful life? If you choose to have children, you will have a life of stress. It goes with the territory. It is also, and anyone who's had children, it's the most wonderful adventure in the world. I mean, anyone who's had children can never imagine living without, without children. But if you choose children, you choose stress. As we've seen, your sympathetic nervous system and stress-related hormones fire up to help you pursue opportunities and avoid threats. While there's certainly a place for healthy passion, and for strong stands against things that are harmful, most of the time we're just overheating, caught up with some carrot or struggling with some stick. Then we feel driven, rattled, stressed, irritated, anxious, definitely not happy. We need to lower the flames. This chapter will cover many ways to do just that. Hey, we're getting that terminology that I wasn't too happy with before, according to Buddha, but we're getting it in this book now. If your body had a fire department, it would be the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's where we'll start. Okay, so the next uh, paragraph. Activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Your body has numerous major systems, including the endocrine, cardiovascular, immune, gastrointestinal, and nervous systems. If you want to use the mind-body connection to lower your stress, cool the fires, and improve your long-term health. What's the optimal point of entry into all of these systems? It's the automatic nervous system. This is because the ANS, which is part of the larger nervous system, is intertwined with and helps regulate every other system, and mental activity has greater direct influence over the ANS than any other bodily system. When you stimulate the parasympathetic wing of the ANS, calming, soothing, healing ripples spread through your body, brain, and mind. Let's explore, the, uh, let's explore a variety of ways to light up the PNS. Relaxation. Relaxing engages the circuitry of the PNS and thus strengthens it. Relaxing also quiets the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system since relaxed muscles send feedback to the alarm systems centers in the brain that, is all, that all is well. When you are very relaxed, it's hard to feel stressed or upset. In fact, the relaxation response may actually alter your genes, how your genes are expressed and thus reduce the cellular damage of chronic stress. You can reap the benefits of relaxation not only by initiating it in specific stressful situations, but also by training your body offline to relax automatically. The methods that follow can be used in either way. First, here are four quick ones. Relax your tongue, eyes, and jaw muscles. Feel tensions draining out your body and sinking down into the earth. Run warm water over your hands. And then four, scan your body for areas that are tense and relax them. Now, this is the biggest bunch of crap I've ever seen, you know? I mean, boy, oh boy, you know, relaxing, activating. I mean, still, you know, 2,500 years ago, nothing's changed, you know? And, you know, the Buddha, when he was a young man, he did martial arts. He was one of the best martial artists in that, in, in, in that um, province. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, he was the son of the king, so maybe that had something to do with him winning all that, you know. But the point is, he was an active, energetic, dynamic guy. But who's the Buddha that most people, whose philosophy is reflected in most uh, um, texts? 
is the Buddha of 80-something years old, who was an old man and was not so energetic anymore. He didn't do karate anymore, okay? I mean, it's amazing he lived to such a long age. But maybe that's a problem, you know, that in, his, in, the, in the text that really counted, he never wrote anything, but in the accounts that his students wrote, okay, of his teachings, this was the older, established Buddha, the man who had, you know, um, really made a difference in India, had all these thousands of disciples. It's not the young, dynamic, karate Buddha. And this is the same type of Buddha we're seeing here. I mean, relaxation. Relax your tongue, eyes, and jaw muscles. Feel tension draining out of your body and sinking down into the earth. Run warm water over your hands. Scan your body for areas in their I mean, imagine some guy coming into the dojo and saying, okay, I'm going to teach you about Buddhism, okay? And relax your tongue, eyes, and jaw. I mean, I think we'd all kind of laugh and say, okay, what's this guy about? You know, this, this is not who we are, okay? This reminds me of, uh, of something that, uh, um, and, um, okay, I had my office at, uh, at U of T, and the office next to mine was empty. It was kept empty so that when they had visiting scholars, sometimes who would be there just to give a lecture, sometimes to give a six-week series of lectures, sometimes to be there for a year. So one day I came in and there was a Chinese man in the office next to me. And I came in, I said, hi, you know, uh, I, you know, you must be here to give a, a lecture. And he said, yeah, yeah, I've heard a lot about you, you know, and we should have a talk. So we went out for lunch. And he's a, a professor at Shanghai University in China. And um, he is considered the greatest expert in China on um, um, Tai Chi. I was trying to think of all the different, uh, all the different things that, because I was written down all the different things that... Um, uh, all the different arts that were taught in China, all the different types of martial arts. But he was, he was the biggest scholar, okay, as well as practitioner on Tai Chi. So uh, I said, wow, that's, that's really interesting. And, and he said, yeah, and I understand you have Karate Dojo. And, and everyone, you know, from U University of Toronto had told me that I've got to meet you and that they would arrange in my office would be next to yours. Can I come and see your dojo? And I said, yeah. So I brought him to the dojo that night, and he, then he started coming on a regular basis. Um, and he was fantastic. I mean, he was there for a year. He was a visiting professor, and uh, we, had a, we had a fantastic relationship. And um, one time, we're having lunch together, and he said, Bert, can you tell me something I don't understand about Canada? And I said, okay, well, what, what is it? And he said... I, I walk, you know, like in the, in the spring and in the summer, I walk down the street and I see all these people doing Tai Chi in the parks here. And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, I understand that that's done a lot in China too. And he said, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we see this in China too. But there's one difference. In China, these are all old people. <laughs> you, know, you know, Tai Chi, it helps with their digestion so that they can go to the bathroom. You know, <laughs> that's why people practice Tai Chi. Young people, they practice wushu. Wushu is karate in, you know, in, in uh, Chinese, okay? Why? I, I see 20-year-old men and women doing Tai Chi, doing these slow movements here. What is this with Canadians? This is for all people who need a laxative, okay? And Tai Chi is one way, you know, to, you don't have to take the medication. You just practice Tai Chi. And it's really good. That's what I've done so many of my studies on. Young people should be doing karate, though. Yeah, they should be punching and kicking and, you know, really being active and using their muscles and developing their muscles. What's this about, you know, Tai Chi? Everyone's doing Tai Chi here. And, you know, it was, it was, it was really true. You know, I mean, you see, it's not so often you see an older person doing that. You see all these young people doing it. Only in Canada. You know, it's, it's really, really strange, huh? But that's what this reminds me of. You know, what? this type of total misunderstanding of what Buddhism is about. Now, this is Chinese Buddhism, not Tibetan Buddhism, okay? I mean, here, here is Tibetan Buddhism, but I mean, what he's talking about is Chinese Buddhism. Chinese Buddhism, when it's Dozen, when it's Buddhism for young people, it's dynamic. You're supposed to be developing your muscles. You're not supposed to be relaxing your tongue, eyes, and jaw muscles. You're supposed to be training, putting everything into your training, becoming strong, and you know what happens after you train? You're relaxed. 
You don't have to run warm run, run, run water over your hands. You go and you take a shower, okay? Because it's good after training to take a shower, right? But you don't have to think about feel tension draining out of your body. You've done that with the training. The tension is gone, okay? All you have to do is train. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to see a mirror, uh, an image of it. You're doing it. You're creating it. And that's what makes real martial arts such a fantastic system of Buddhism, okay, of Dozen. Zen, remember, is meditation. Dozen is active and moving, okay, dynamic meditation. And this is what, this is what, well, I was about to say real Buddhism. This is what the Japanese and the Chinese Buddhism is about. This is where you find the martial arts. In um, my discussions with uh, colleagues at, uh, at Nihon Taiku Dagaku, you have to understand, at Nihon Dai, this is an ath a university that is only for athletics, okay? You get a degree, you get a Bachelor of Physical and Health Education. It's not a normal university. You don't take literature courses and things like that. It's about becoming a great athlete. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, like we have engineering, you know, universities like MIT, you know, which is, uh, you can take courses. And if I mean, it's basically an engineering school. Um, but it, it, it's really, really amazing when I would talk to uh, my, my <coughs> colleagues there, the athletes and also the older, the older people who were the administrators and and um, uh, the, the professors, you know, for example, there were courses in physiology and things like that. Nobody took them seriously. <laughs> Nobody cared whether you passed or failed. But you know, the important thing is get out there and train. But we would we would talk sometimes, especially after I got back from the monasteries, and I would talk with my teacher and with you know the, the people pictured here and a whole bunch of the you know I. I don't want to list a whole bunch of names that you won't ever remember, and who cares? But we would talk about Tibet and about the Dalai Lama. And one of the things that was interesting to talk about is that I said that if it were Japanese karate people who lived in Tibet, now you know Tibet is the highlands, right? It's, it's a very high, you know, high, high altitude country, okay? I said, I bet you, if instead of teaching Tibetan Buddhism and all the boys coming into the monastery and there's no baby boys because they, they'd go right into the monastery and there's no boys who grow up into men and, became, and learn martial arts. But I bet you, if the samurai were magically, instead of having developed in Japan, they had developed in China, in, in, uh, in Tibet, that China never would have attacked. Because China would have said, this is uphill, right? Tibet is the highland. And the Mongolians once attacked Japan after they had conquered China, after they had conquered Russia, after they had conquered India, all of Asia, and were into Europe already. And they made the mistake of attacking Japan, thinking, you know, this stupid island country is the only place in Asia that we haven't, we haven't conquered. And they attacked Japan, and they lost. And they could never figure this out. I mean, millions of soldiers, the Japanese having just a few thousand. Japan was a small island country. And so they attacked again, thinking this was a fluke. The Japanese got lucky, and they lost again. They never attacked Japan again. The countries in Asia, they would fight amongst themselves, but they would avoid attacking Japan, because they know they would lose. Because although Japan was small, they had the samurai. And the samurai had that samurai spirit, that they would never give up, they would never quit, that their country will never be defeated. When I said that, you know, everyone started laughing and saying, yeah, you know, I mean, it would be, it would be, a, it would have been a whole different world. Because it's not like, it's not like, you know, like Tibet was flat and the Chinese could just simply overrun them by their numbers. It was the fact that they would have to go uphill through the mountains and they would be fighting a canny people, smart, trained. And the Chinese, of course, if they sent their whole army in, they could have defeated it. But how many millions of men do they want to lose? I mean, you realize that it's not, you know, there's a certain price to be paid for victory and it would be a stupid price to be paid. But the Tibetans, they didn't have the samurai. 
They didn't have, they did have an army, but it wasn't much of an army. It wasn't anything that was able to fight, and the Chinese were able to get the jump on them because they weren't prepared. Well, you know, a country that's independent, if it wants to stay independent, you better have an army. And you better have an army that can really defend itself. And so, you know, it's again, it goes, you know, that there are consequences of your actions. So if you're a Tibetan Buddhist and you think the greatest thing in the world is the monasteries and the learning that goes on in the monasteries, there's other things in life that count too, like having children, okay? Because for one thing, it will give you a, a, a larger population. The population is, 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 was always too small in Tibet. Well, of course it was too small in Tibet. Nobody's having children. But you also just need an army to make sure that nobody's going to attack you. There was no reason that this had to happen. And as I said, it's not necessarily that you have to have an army so strong that you can defeat the Chinese. You're not going to defeat the Chinese. But as I said, there's a cost to be paid, and the Chinese would not have paid that cost. But anyway, that's something that's all in the past. It's going to be very difficult for Tibet to reconquer uh, the, their, their country now. Um, we'll see what happens in the years to come. But uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet too much money on, uh, on seeing a, a, an, 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 a newly independent Tibet. Okay. I wanted to continue on page 80, 80, uh, 83. Just uh, the top of the, uh, top of the page. Mindfulness just means being fully aware of something in the moment with it, and not judging or resisting it. Um, I like this because it's something we talk about in the martial arts also, uh, all the time. Mindfulness means being fully aware of something, in the moment with it, and not judging or resisting it. We can go on to page 88. As we saw in chapter 2, this is the top of the page, the brain continually scans your inner and outer worlds for threats. When any are detected, your stress response system fires up. Occasionally, this vigilance is warranted, but usually it's excessive, driven <coughs> by the amygdala hippocampus reactions to past events that are no longer likely. The anxiety that results is unnecessary and unpleasant, but it primes your brain and body to overreact to small things. On the next page, the last, the last paragraph on page 89, bring mindfulness to fear. Anxiety, dread, apprehension, worry, and even panic are just mental states like any other. Recognize fear when it arises. Observe the feeling of it in your body. Watch it try to convince you that you should be alarmed. See it change and move on. Verbally describe your, to yourself what you're feeling to increase frontal lobe regulation of the limbic system. Notice how the awareness which contains fear is itself never fearful. Keeping separate, keep separating from the fear. Settle back into the vast space of awareness through which fear passes like a cloud. Like a cloud. Again, this is another paragraph that bothers me a great deal. It'd be a lot better to develop fearlessness based on power, courage, training, confidence—the type of things that you develop in uh, in uh, Asian martial arts that encompasses Buddhism through its self-development, through its compassion, but lives in the real world. And the real world is not about containing fear or, you know, I mean, just everything in this paragraph, recognize fear when it arises, observe the feeling of it in your body. This is nobody who's ever been confronted by three guys with knives. Yeah, recognize fear when it arises. I think I recognize it. Three guys, they each have knives. Okay. Recognizing the fear. Observe the feeling of it in your body. Oh, yeah. I'm observing that feeling. Watch it try to convince you that you should be alarmed. Right. I shouldn't be alarmed. See it change and move on. Come on. You know? You know, I, I, there's so many, so many books like this that is such a misrepresentation of what the power of Buddhism could be, should be, and is in certain cultures, but not in other cultures. And that's the fact that, we, you know, we, we don't deal with funny little stuff like this, you know, being attacked by somebody, 
you know, like the other night in the dojo where we were doing counterattacks against somebody uh, grabbing you in a choking hold. Um, that's real fear, yeah. But, you know, you deal with it not by letting it take you over, you know, letting you, you know, letting it separate from your body. You deal with it because you've trained your body, your mind, your spirit, that when things like this happen, you go into automatic mode. You know exactly how to handle yourself because you've seen roundhouse kicks coming at you a thousand times already, okay? You've seen multiple people attacking you. You've learned by doing your katas how to have perfect balance, how to be able to block and counterattack. It becomes automatic. The fearfulness, you don't have a chance to think about it. And that's really one of the most important concepts of Buddhism, the muno kokoro. You don't think about something. When somebody attacks you, it just becomes automatic. Mind without conscious thought. You've trained to such a high degree <coughs> that your body, your mind, your spirit are all in that high state of tension, not a bad tension, but that attention ready to react like a tiger. Not somebody who's totally relaxed. You can't fight when you're totally relaxed, okay? But you're totally in charge of yourself. Here's a fellow, or a group of fellows, because there's four fellows who wrote this book. This is the neurologist speaking, but certainly not the Buddhist. For example, I realized some years ago that the training of my head had gotten out in front of my cultivation of my heart, so I've been focusing more on the latter ever since. Whoa. Where has he been all these years, you know? Um, I think the context of that is that uh, he realized he had been unfair to his wife and a number of things, and so um, too much training with my head, and uh, I should have been training more with my heart. One of the most uh, important words in, the, in the Japanese is a kokoro. Um, and um, there's an expression about that, that you... You think with your you think with your heart. That seems kind of funny. You think with your heart. But that's the essence of Kokoro. Kokoro is made up of two characters the character for brain and the character for heart. And when you say Muno Kokoro, so Kokoro there means mind. Mu means um, without conscious thought. Mu no kokoro, mind without conscious thought. So you see how the two characters that characterize the word are mind and heart. So when a Japanese thinks, he always thinks with his heart. Because you don't have to say the mind because the word kokoro means mind, right? Did everyone follow what I'm saying? So it's one of the important things about Buddhism that the two are supposed to be in sync. You don't just think with your mind. And this is one of the things that the Japanese most criticize Westerners for, that there's always this dichotomy, that, especially amongst men, that they think with their minds and they don't have enough heart. And women are accused of thinking with their heart. You know, or, you know that's, that's the concept that men always have of women, right? They think with their heart. They don't use their mind. But to the Japanese, it just doesn't make any sense. That whether you're a man or a woman, kokoro means thinking with your heart. That the two things go together. And it's just it's just built the, the way the language, you know, because language influences the way you think. Whether we like it or not, it influences the way we think. And this is one example of, of, uh, of uh, Japanese language. For him to say something like that, to, I realized that the training of my head had gotten out in front of the cultivation of my heart. So where has his Buddhism been all these years? Because this is the most fundamental part of Buddhism, that you must think with your heart. It makes you a different person, especially if you're a man, because thinking should come automatically from here, as well as your head. Okay, so let me just finish uh, uh, on this. This is the abstract from Martial Arts Training and Mental Health and Exercise and Self-Help. Um, Mental health means more than just absence of psychiatric illness. It is a state of being, characterized in part by an overall sense of mental and physical harmony. Increasingly, people have emphasized their own power in realizing this goal. For many, however, the question is, how? For many, karate and judo training mean physical conditioning at best and unmitigated violence at the other extreme. The authors of the present study, 
that's Francoise and myself. The authors of the present study, however, examine the impact of traditional karate do training on a group of participants at the University of Toronto Karate Program and the Toronto Academy of Karate and Judo. Both settings emphasize a program of highly disciplined training oriented equally towards mental development and physical conditioning. Both quantitative and qualitative analysis converge in finding a high degree of personal self-development and well-being as a result of the participation. The findings have significant implications concerning the process of self-help without recourse to psychiatric systems, that is, the maintenance of a balanced lifestyle based on physical and mental, uh, mental fitness. And we'll give you a summary of, uh, of uh, what it was, what the, what the study was about. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is complex, and um, uh, there's a lot of data and charts and diagrams here. Um, we'll do the best we can to make it, uh, to make it comprehensible. Um, and I'm sure we'll succeed. But if you have any questions, please bring them up, okay? Because uh, uh, I would hate to think that I left something out, or maybe Francois left something. No, it would be me who would leave something out. <laughs> and uh, nobody, nobody brought it up, okay? So let me know if you're, if you're not uh, uh, following it. Um, if anyone wants to read this, uh, you know, I'll bring it to the dojo uh, um, tomorrow, and uh, the next few days, so you can, you can read it in the dojo. It's, it is an academic study, so it's not, you know, it's not like we usually talk or write, you know, this is a, you know, because it's a scholarly journal. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure seeing everyone here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.